Well, happy Tuesday, everyone. It is so good to be here with you guys. Uh, we'll give you a second to hop on here, but we're back with Tuesdays at 12, as we just about always are. Um, and we are super excited to be here with you. We have a couple questions, not a whole lot. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to submit them in the comments. But otherwise, we'll roll through the questions that we have. All right. Um, first question I'll throw out there. I just got from my guy Jack downstairs, uh, one of the kids of someone on staff here, and he <laughs> wants to know, um, if God created everything, then why didn't he just not create Satan? And the answer is he didn't create Satan. He created an angel who then exercised his own free will and became the adversary or, or Satan. So, um, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard for us, particularly for a child, to separate that, the, the notion that we can become something very other than what, what we were originally created to be, but that's the simple answer to it, you know. Sure. All right, well, there you have it. Um, next question we got today, and pretty much the rest from here, unless uh, any questions come in on the comments. So we've got a, a lot in the category of the book of Revelation. Um, so the first question we have regarding that is, how do you view the me meaning of Revelation 3.10? Yeah, it's um, one of the letters to the seven churches, and it's a church that Jesus has nothing but commendation for, the church of Philadelphia. And in verse 10, it actually reads, Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. So the way um, <clears throat> some Christians have interpreted this, you, you have Christians that when it comes to this last period of time that uh, Jesus described, many in the Old Testament described, the book of Revelation describes in detail, it's usually called the tribulation. Uh, some will put it into a seven-year period. It's really, truly, the great tribulation is a three-and-a-half-year period. But... Um, some that are pre-tribulational, meaning that they believe that um, Jesus will secretly appear in heaven, he'll take his people out of the earth just before the tribulation starts on earth. Okay, then he'll come at the end of the seven years, return with them, set up his kingdom, and so on. So they're called pre-tribulational. God's people are taken before pre-tribulation. They base it partially on that verse. That's, that verse could be answered in a lot of ways. That It's just saying that there's a promise given to a specific church church that resided in Philadelphia, uh, that they would be kept from this hour of trial that was going to come on earth. Well, you know, God can keep us from the hour of trial in numerous ways. You look at the Israelites when they were in Egypt and the trials, the plagues were coming upon the Egyptians. They didn't all affect the Israelites at all. You know, they were kept from it. Uh, frankly, even death can keep you from it, you know. So uh, we know that during the tribulation period, about half the earth's population is going to very quickly be decimated. So it could be saying nothing more than before you face this uh, severity uh, of the most severe points of the trial, you'll, you'll be taken out. So my point is, is that you can't really build a very strong case from that one verse. And that is the problem with the pre-tribulational system in general, is that it is based on presupposition. The presupposition is essentially this. If we're God's people, He's not going to let His people go through the tribulation. Now, that sounds good, except, <laughs> you know, the early Christians in the first century were eaten by lions, Nero lit them on fire as torches in the Colosseum. I think that's tribulation, <laughs> you know? So, and Jesus himself said, you know, in this world you will have trouble or tribulation, the very same word, uh, Philipsis Greek word. So, far from us expecting or, or told to, to expect to be taken out of trouble, out of tribulation, we are in fact, through the entire New Testament, told to prepare for trouble and tribulation. But Jesus said, be of good cheer, he had overcome the world. So, uh, again, this is not one of these uh, core doctrinal issues. I mean, good, good godly people can agree to disagree, whether it's pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, which is the right position, the post-trib. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> well, there you have it. That's uh, Revelation 3.10 for you. Um, the next kind of section of questions we have relate to uh, the thousand-year period or the millennial reign there. And the first one is, if we are still alive during this time, will we age like we are now, or is it different? And is that a thousand years like we know years, or faster? It appears to be a genuine thousand years. And it's interesting because, um, you know, people have theorized that God's going to end the program in a week. A week of years, a thousand years is a day, a day is a thousand years, and that, you know, this would be the last day of the week, and they postulate that since Israel's been reborn, we're at the end of the 6,000 year uh, period, so the next thing to come is the millennium. Anyway, the millennium 
is a, uh, a real period of time. It's an actual thousand years where Christ and his people will rule and reign, literally govern and supervise uh, cities and counties and you know nations all over the earth. And for a thousand years, the rule and will of God will be what people will experience. It'll be a time of prosperity and safety. People will start living much longer. Um, the environment itself will be affected. The animal kingdom will be affected by it. They, they won't be dangerous anymore. But the question is, is when does this period start. So the question was, you know, well, if we're alive when this millennial period starts, would we age naturally or, or not? Well, just prior to this event, you have something that is often called the rapture of God's people. It, it just means that Jesus returns in the air, takes the, the dead followers, those that have trusted in God and been reconciled to Him, they receive their resurrection bodies first, then those that are alive are suddenly, in, in the, the twinkling of an eye, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, are, are transformed. And so we receive our immortal resurrection bodies. Okay, So when the millennium starts, those that have been reconciled to God in faith throughout all the ages will be living in immortal bodies. So we won't age. Now, the question then I think becomes, and I, and I think this is maybe another part of it, um, the people that are born, of course, during this time. So once again, to set the, the context, uh, the millennium occurs after the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ triggers the first resurrection, where all those that have been reconciled to God in trust, they receive their immortal resurrection bodies, okay? But then you have people that are still on earth that survived all the tribulation of the three and a half years, seven years, however you want to look at it. It decimates about half of the population right now. You've got about seven billion people, so that means there's going to be at least three billion people, maybe three and a half billion people still alive. So the question is, is what about them? So now Jesus and his loyal people through all the ages are in immortal bodies. They're ruling and reigning over the planet, supervising life. If you're born or still alive this time, how will you age? You will age just like we age now, with one exception. It appears there are scriptures, particularly in the Old Testament, that hint that those that are born during that time, uh, they will live much longer lives because the pristine condition of the earth, once again, who knows, the food supply chain might, might be <laughs> dramatically improved, all the additives taken out, who knows, you know. <laughs> so again, the people that are alive, they're gonna live you know, just what, what, what our normal life cycle would have been. But the people that are born during the millennium, they will live to be much older. Okay. Very interesting. So we got another question um, around the same topic, and it says, Who will come back with Christ for this 1,000-year period? Revelation 24, 20, <coughs> verse 4, <laughs> talks about uh, those who are martyred. Are those the only people who are coming back at this time? The second resurrection being everyone else who had died. 20 verse 5. Final judgment takes place at this time. Yeah, it, uh, the reading is coming from uh, Revelation 20, and um, it, it, it's easier sometimes just, just to read it. Uh, it starts in verse 4, it says, And I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the Word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life, and they reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. And here's the key phrase. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power on them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So the question is, is the first resurrection... Uh, going to con consist of only those that are martyred. Well, that's not what it indicates. It's just making a statement that those that had been martyred will also be in this company of those that, as I said earlier, have trusted God throughout all the ages. They'll be given these immortal bodies. Um, the term first resurrection, we see a picture of it in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50 through 52. We see it in Matthew 24, verse uh, uh, 29 through 31. We see it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 16, no, th 13 through 19. And it's simply that scene again where those that are alive are instantaneously transformed and they are lifted to meet Christ in the air 
And then just like in the Roman days, when, when a Roman conqueror would come back to, to Rome, the people would all rush out, you know, miles out. They would rush out to meet the conquering, you know, commander. And then they would come back in with him to celebrate his victory and so forth. Well, we'll meet the Lord in the air as he is coming toward earth to set up his, his kingdom. You know, we will join him in the air. So this first resurrection, it consists of all those who have ever been reconciled to God through trust. And so it won't be just the martyrs, but it will certainly include them. The emphasis on the martyrs there is because they will have been martyred so, so uh, recent to the event. You know, it, it looks like for a time that uh, the forces of evil are dominating and winning. I mean, it even says in Revelation 13 that the, uh, what we call the Antichrist, the beast, um, that he wins, he conquers the, the followers of God. It's the same, it says the same thing in the book of Daniel. But it just means that he's, he's able to kill them, to uh, martyr them. It, it doesn't mean that he ultimately has victory. So. Sure. Awesome. Um, that was probably a lot to take in. Hopefully you got a pen, paper, taking notes. Um, but another question on the same topic. Uh, it says, wicked slash evil people will, will survive the tribulation. Are they with Satan for the 1,000 years? Um, this is a really interesting thing that, that people often don't think about. Like I said before, about 3 billion people are going to survive this terrible time on earth and not all of them are going to be uh, righteous. They're affecting most of them will not be. And so what about them? Well, well, they're, they're going to be, the easiest way to describe it is um, they're going to be living in rather restrictive conditions. For example, if, if a thief is in a, in a department store and, and intending to shoplift but sees a cop there, the, she, the, thie, the thief will behave just like an honest person. But they're not an honest person. They're a thief. The only reason they're behaving is because they know they can't get away with it. Well, that's what the millennium will be like. These wicked people will still be alive, and they will have an opportunity to truly uh, trust in Christ, to repent, to change their minds about life. But many of them evidently will just do what they have to do because they don't have a whole lot of choice. The, the earth will be um, guided and ruled by... Uh, righteous rulers and super supervisors and so forth and uh, they just won't have an opportunity. Now, a lot of them will die during this thousand years and they'll have to be judged ultimately. But the interesting thing to me, and this is one of the most difficult portions of Scripture in the whole Bible for me, is that after this thousand years where Christ and His people have ruled and reigned and the earth is this beautiful pristine place, there's no more crime, there's no more war, there's nothing like that, uh, Satan is released from his prison and he is allowed to go out and tempt these people because these people have never had any temptation, you know, the people that are born during the millennium. And ironically, uh, they rebel in mass. And that's when you have the final destruction of the earth as we know it, and then it's rebuilt into what's called the new earth, the new heaven and the new earth, and that's the eternal state of things. But um, it's a, it's a troubling thing, you know, that after a thousand year reign, beautiful life on earth, that when people are given a shot at something else, they take it. They take it in, they take it in mass, you know. Yeah, it's a little troubling to think about <laughs> it that. It really is, you yeah. Know, have it all so good and then you uh, yeah. throw it all away. But, but, but just a, a thought on that, you know, if you take it in a small scale, we've all seen in those stories of people that, uh, oh, I don't know, they grow up in the, the ideal family, the ideal home, the ideal conditions, you know, and yet they, they take a very different path. This is the, the uh, amazing part of the way God has made us, that we, we truly are free. And uh, vice versa, you know stories of people that grow up in the most um, evil sets of circumstances, the most dire, and yet they choose somehow to, um, when given the opportunity, to, to turn to Christ, to turn to, to righteous living. So the notion that we're uh, products of our environment, it's only true to a certain extent. God has still preserved free will in human beings, and there's endless examples of how it can be used, no matter how good your circumstances are, no, no matter how bad. When you study in the book of Kings, uh, book of Kings, the second, second Kings, Second Chronicles, and when you have the histories of all the kings of Israel, you find the same pattern. Some of them had wonderful families, godly, you know, uh, environments, and they grew up to be scoundrels. And some of them grew up in hellish environments, and they grew up to be 
wonderful godly people, so sometimes there's no rhyme or reason. <laughs> yeah, that is, uh, that is interesting for sure. Well, we have just one more question on this subject, um, and the final one is, if we survive the tribulation as a Christ follower, are we guaranteed heaven or still have free will to sin when Satan is unleashed for one last time, which is kind of what you were just talking about. Right? Yeah, but it, it touches or it allows it allows me to speak a little bit about a subject that I think is misunderstood. Okay, when we've already been transformed, translated, raptured, um, you know, whatever term you want to use, and we receive our immortal resurrection bodies, we will no longer, um, let, me, let me phrase this the way it should be said, we will never sin again, okay? But the question comes, could we sin, okay? Um, does something mechanical occur when we receive our new resurrection body that kind of robotizes us so that we can't, we can't sin. Uh, the answer is absolutely not. not. That, that would diminish our humanity. That would diminish the image of God. I mean, God himself, he can sin, but he will never sin, okay? I could drink a glass of poison, but you can never convince me to drink a glass of poison. That, that's how sin will appear to those who have been uh, given their resurrection in mortal bodies, who now see Christ face to face, who now see life in, in a perfect light with a, with a perfect um, cleansed brain and, and, and all of our inner systems working together the way they should be. So it won't be that we can't exercise our will in the wrong way, but what Christ has accomplished by the sacrificial revelation of God's goodness is no one ever will distrust him, no one ever will rebel against him, no one will ever want to again. Uh, that's all accomplished because of Christ, because we know that's not true with the angels. The, the angels were essentially what we might say perfect. Now perfect is a really, it's a, it's a relative thing because we're always in process. We're, we're gonna be in process through eternity. We're always gonna be learning. We're always gonna be changing. You know, again, Christians don't like to think this way. It, it rattles some of them, their stability, but it's, it's okay because what Christ has accomplished has so convinced and won our hearts, no one will ever distrust or disobey God again. But we'll still be free moral agents, free will. We, we, we could, but we won't. Yeah. So that's the, the best answer I could give on that. Yeah, and as unsettling as it could be for some people, I think also for a lot of people, it gives them a picture of heaven that might actually be a little more enjoyable. That yes. It's still growing and learning. Absolutely. And it's it's turned into an automaton. Exactly. Um, God is such a creative beating, being, and His knowledge is, is endless, so we'll be learning cool, new, exciting things, I suspect, all through eternity. Yeah. yeah. Which sounds a little better than just endlessly playing on a harp. Yeah, the yeah. The, the harp on the cloud, uh, it's just, it's not as bad as the accordion on the cloud, but <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good scene. <laughs> Well, that is just about all the questions we have for today. I don't know if any came in over there, nothing on there. So we do have a little thing coming up tomorrow, in fact. Would yes. you like to uh, speak into that at all? Yes. Uh, we were snowed out this past Sunday, and so uh, we're getting ready to start a new series of messages, and it's kind of, a, it's kind of a different sort of a series, and it is such that it will be really important for as many people to get the first message as is possible for the rest of the series to have as much meaning as is possible. So we decided we would do a service on Wednesday night to try to make up for that. We're hoping we don't get snowed out this weekend. There's a threat of that too. Uh, if we don't get snowed out, well, we'll be in the second message in the series on Sunday. If we do get snowed out though, we, we've made a decision that we will in the future always, if we get snowed out on the weekend or rained out from a hurricane or something like that, if Wednesday permits, or even Thursday permits, we will do a midweek service to make up for it. So th this, this is new for us and I'm kind of excited about it. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun, a lot of excitement. And um, we really hope um, as many people as is possible, I know this could get a little late for some people with small children. We hope as many people as possible will come on out and, uh, and join with us on this. Yeah, and so it's, it's going to be something new, it's something exciting, a little different than uh, you might be used to church on Wednesday night. It'll be just like a Sunday morning, except for put it on Wednesday night, so you'll have the student environments open, so your kids will be in their class having a great experience there, mm -hmm. and Randy will be out there teaching, there'll be music, it'll be uh, Yeah, it'll be just, nine just like Sunday morning, except it'll be dark out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Although for some of us, we're used to getting here when this it's dark This is true. When I get, when I, in fact, it's funny. This time of year, when I get here, it's dark. And when I leave here, it's dark now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 
that's a bit of a time warp sometimes. Yeah. But uh, actually, I'm really excited for this message, message series that's coming up. Uh, something that, you know, questions that we've talked about around here a little bit. Um, right. A group of us have kind of been taking, I guess, almost a year now covering this topic. We're a little yeah. slow, I guess. But uh, <laughs> do you want to tell them anything about the series that's coming up? Uh, yes. It, it's a series that's going to be very different in that, you know, usually we're, we're like most churches, we start with the Bible or, or we're mostly going to depend on the Bible for our answers. And of course, that's still our position. But this series will be different in that we're going to, we're going to deliberately set the Bible aside and we're just going to use two powers that God has given to human beings, the power of, of observation and reasoning. And we're going to see where does that actually lead us? Because, because there are some people that try to insinuate today that Christians are just weak people, that we just want somebody to rescue us, that we're, we're, not, uh, we're not very strong when it comes to, to thinking through what we believe and why we believe it, that we don't have a good evidence basis for our beliefs, that it's not reasonable, that it's childish thinking. And so we're, we're going to kind of take those notions on and we're, we're just going to use observation and reason and see where that leads us. Now, we will include scripture, but what we're going to see is, is does, it, does it match up? When we use just observation and just our reasoning abilities, does that, does that mesh with what we indeed find in scripture? So that, that'll be the approach to this. Yeah, well, I, I'm really excited. I think you guys will really enjoy it. Um, and it's tomorrow night, Wednesday at 7 o'clock. We can't tell you that enough. It's Wednesday at 7 o'clock, just like always. One last thought. If you're online today and if you have people that are kind of skeptical or they have questions, they're open, but they're, they're kind of, you know, eye roll when it comes to the whole Christian scene, this would be a great series to invite them out to because it's going to start right where everybody is at, you know, ground zero. You know, wh why, why do we believe that God exists at all? You know, so that, that's where we'll, we'll be taking our journey from. Yeah, I think it's going to be great. Um, you guys are going to really enjoy it. I'll be there with a pen in hand and some notes to take. Uh, you might want to bring like your FCF journal this week because it's <laughs> it might be more than one page of notes, but uh, it's going to be good. So until then, we will see you guys tomorrow night, Wednesday at 7 p.m for a special service, and then again on Sunday for uh, the second week of the season. Unless it snows. <laughs> Unless it snows, in which case we will uh, be doing it during the middle of the week, probably on Thursday then, and that'll be a really exciting time. But hopefully... And, and actually, let, let's tell them why Thursday, be, be, because Thursday next week is a baptismal service. Mm -hmm. and, and so what we are going to do is, if we get snowed out this weekend, we're going to combine the whole worship service, the whole teaching, the music, the whole nine yards, and the baptismal service. So, we, you know, we know it's a little confusing, two, two different weeks that are going to have something different in the middle of the week. Wednesday, tomorrow night, this week, next week, Thursday. <laughs> baptismal service and or service and baptismal service. Yeah. <laughs> and so, even if we don't have service on s uh, next Thursday because it doesn't snow, we really hope you'll come out to the baptism and support those people who are making such a big decision. And maybe you're one of those people. And we just want to say congratulations if you are coming out to get baptized. Uh, next week. It's going to be a lot of fun. We love baptisms here. And uh, yeah, so we will see you guys tomorrow, Wednesday night at seven o'clock. And until then, have a good one, guys.